I've seen the worst And there is nothing left for me to hate So I can lay me down My brothers on the ground I bled today until Coyote comes to raise me up Good evening, welcome to the Scottish Rugby Podcast. It is myself, John Anderson, in the hot seat once again. Joining me tonight, for the moment, we have Johnny McGinty. Johnny, good evening. Hello, how are we doing? I'm very well. Do you know what I really appreciate in a person, Johnny? The ability to be on time. Do you know there's a very famous American football coach who says the best ability is availability. And here we are. I've got, the, we I've are. got the best ability, that's all I'm saying. The, the dream team has arrived. Um, yes, we may be joined by some special guests throughout the evening whose uh, timekeeping is not quite as up to spec as me and McGinty here. Um, if you're stumbling upon this podcast for the first time, welcome. It's good to have you along. Um, we will be looking at all things Scottish rugby. Um, there's been a couple of bits of news and uh, we'll have a, have a re- review of some fixtures. There was... Um, what one of the teams was up against a, a, a you know some sort of small some small South African side, um, you know it was it was pretty uh, and and the other our other team were victorious against that absolute giant of world rugby uh, at home at the Dam Health. So we will we will delve into those possibly before those people arrive because if we go, uh, really making the most of him not being yet, are you? Yeah, yeah, we can properly batter into this. Um, but yeah, if if you if you like what you hear, head over to patreon.com slash Scottish Rugby Podcast where you can subscribe uh, for three pounds a month and get some exclusive content, including our we do it every 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 uh, week after the podcast, we do we continue on and we do hands in the ruck, which is our any other business section where we fundamentally put the world of rugby to rights. And I've got expectations that tonight might well be spectacular because uh, there has been some some classic world rugby stuff going on this week. Uh, so we will come to that in due course. Um, let's start, though. That, that was like, that's a record for me how quickly I got through that. That was very quick. I'm actually yeah. still researching something. Oh, oh so, well, so, sorry. There you go. See, normally you're, you're so much quicker than I expected. <laughs> I'm glad speed impresses you, Johnny. Um, <laughs> right. So let's move on to the news. We will start with uh, some signing news. Uh, at the Dam Health, uh, Paddy Harrison, who has shown a bit of form over the last uh, few weeks uh, and is v- very highly rated over uh, at the Dam Health. He's signed his first pro contract. They've announced the length of time as well, which they've started doing this that. again, Johnny. Yeah. It's like it's yeah, gone out of very fashion. Very interesting. So, Paddy, Paddy, Paddy Harrison, a four year deal, uh, a young, young hooker. As I said, he's, he's been looking promising over the last few while. Had a very good game at the weekend as well. So I think that's a, it's a good signing for them, Johnny. Good to see them signing um, non-British and Irish Lions as well. <laughs> he's going to be here in like 10 minutes. You might as well get it out. I know. Um, I'm just, just going for it. No, I think I think it's a really good signing. He, um, he's certainly shown he's got more than enough, I think, to make it with Edinburgh. Um, we've seen quite a few sort of emerging talents in both teams the last couple of months. Yeah, he looks probably the most 
full-time professional rugby ready of all of them, I would say. Yeah. Be interested to see if he can keep it up for, for four years, but I mean, he's certainly off to a good start, and he um, he got Edinburgh out of a bit of a sticky situation on Saturday. So the thing, thing is, as well with Edinburgh, obviously they've got Dave Dave Cherry there and and Stuart McInally. McInally is not the youngest uh, at the roost anymore. He's he's um, getting on a wee bit. There's an opportunity for Harrison to to grab that shirt and go. Do you know what? No, no, I'm going to be. I will be your hooker for the next four years, um, and really dominate that shirt. Definitely, and you know, as as much as you know, we just talked him up and said he's had a really good month and he's playing really well. He looks professional ready. He doesn't look test ready, no. so I don't think they have to worry for for quite a long time about losing him for any internationals or anything like that. Um, I think Rambo probably we're not going to see in many Scotland squads, but Dave Cherry we still might. So they are going to have a need to have an extra hooker. In there that they could get into a match day squad and and he's shown he's more than capable of being a match day squad member and probably progressing into being the starter. So I tell you what's not um not match ready. Let's put it this way. The Edinburgh Twitter feed. I've just <laughs> I've just scrolled through it and honestly it's like it's like I've I've just a PM Johnny in a wee side chat to say it is like looking at someone's Bebo profile profile. The, the, like the, the emojis, like all the emojis, like someone's getting commission on their emojis. It's ridiculous, and I felt dirty looking through it as well. But that—that's maybe just like my Glasgow bias. To be fair, they—they um, they did absolutely body that guy trying to accuse him of virtual virtue. They did. The they week. did. That was magnificent. That was very, very and, funny. And we did call that at the time. That was spectacular. But I mean, I just want a post without an emoji. Just that That's all I'm asking for. Could you make that happen? That's how you get engagement, John. Have you never had to sit it's, through some sort of nonsense well, social media this seminar? This is what you do, Johnny. This is you, you're the you're the media guru of the operation here. I'm just the loudmouth nonsense of the operation. So. I depressingly did have to do a lot of that in my previous job. Um, nice. And yeah, like we quite often would get sent on a social media course, and they would talk <laughs> about how. You need to do these things to build your engagement, and yeah, it just makes me a bit sad, really. Yuck, yuck. Well, let's move on to happier topics. Um, former Glasgow coach Danny Wilson is no longer on the SRU payroll. Woo! Uh, Danny Danny Wilson has joined um, has joined Harlequins of all the teams in the world, uh, and not just that, he is the line out and contact coach. Now, Johnny, I will refer you back to Danny Wilson's time in charge of Glasgow. What were a couple of areas that went spectacularly wrong for Glasgow? This this is a weird thing, is that I saw that and I thought, I don't remember Danny Wilson being all that much of a line-out or contact area expert. He'd, he'd done scrum coaching before. He's, he's, done, he's done like scrum coaching, I think, and he has coached forwards. But, yeah, line out and contact is very specialist. And yeah. Glasgow really and struggled actually, in those two areas. To be honest, I uh, find the the idea of a contact area coach a bit of a head scratcher and kind of a, a wage rob anyway. <laughs> would, would, you, would you prefer it to be a breakdown coach? Is that okay? Well, I, anything like that. Like... I don't know. Maybe I'm totally wrong because obviously I'm a back, and so <laughs> as much as I do, I do have a bit of a bad habit of trying to get involved in as many breakdowns as I can. It's not, <laughs> it's not really my area. But I just, when you've already got a forwards coach and a scrum coach, I don't understand what you need a specific contact area coach for. So that that's a really interesting thing. Given that, so at the weekend, Pete Horn was getting all the love um, from from pundits and and from the Glasgow kind of Ryan Wilson and all those guys. He was getting all the love. Yeah, and he's he, skills coach, isn't he? Because that's he another is, one. But he's specialising on the breakdown. Is he? He is. Yes, in Glasgow, are the only team in the league that have got a sub three second uh, average uh, ball speed. So 
Pete Horn is heard getting that on comms play, on Sunday actually playing quickly, and the guys the guys were saying like obviously uh, the attack coach has, has got them moving pretty well, but it's the speed of ball, and Pete Horn is getting all the love for that. So may, maybe there's something in it, John. Maybe yeah, maybe they are something because I just remember when it was Wales that had one first, was it? They made Sam Warburton break down coach. I think. Uh, was it Warburton? Probably, yeah. That's just what Very, very briefly. Yeah. And then everyone did suddenly break down coaches and contact area coaches and and the very distressingly vague skills coaches were kind of <laughs> appearing like pretty much everywhere. It's, it's good when you've got a skills coach that actually, like, they, they identify what skill they're coaching and then they kind of, that improves. Like, we've, we've had some skills coaches over the over the uh, the years at Scotland, your was it Wade that kind of comes to mind? Um, <sighs> skills coach, still no idea what skill he was coaching, if any. Uh, but yeah, we, we've done this before, and uh, it does seem like a bit of a catch-all term. But it's nice. It to does, see- yeah. It always seems like it's like a it's like a job for a recently retired pal. <laughs> and maybe I don't know. Maybe maybe every team gets offered like very specific coaching inputs so that's what they send their skill coach on so maybe your skills coach is always coaching different skills depending on what course he's just been on it just <laughs> seems a bit weird well what whatever whatever course pete horn's just been on he is he's doing a stellar job at glasgow for the breakdown because uh and we'll come on to that in, in due course uh to, to answer a few of the questions coming in yeah so he was uh danny wilson was forwards coach at scotland uh, during the time where we thought alan dale was uh a world beaten scrummager so Take, take, take that as you will. No, I, I, you know I have no love for Danny Wilson. I don't rate him in the slightest, so I'm, I'm not even going to, you know, sugarcoat that one. Um, but he's off. You know he's let, let him have a job if he, if he wants to have a job. I've got no issue with him going and finding a job. I just think that the choice of role for him certainly raised my eyebrows. Let's yeah. put it that way. Well, I, I mean, no disrespect to him. Like it's, it's not his fault. People are hiring him. It's you know, it's, it's it's you know, someone at Harlequins has clearly went. Do you know what we really need? Having just lost their attack coach to England, I know what we need. We need a line out and a contact coach. That is what we need. Let's get Danny Wilson, who absolutely done for Glasgow uh, for two years. Let's get him on board. That's the game. That's what we need. Turgid, turgid play. No, that's definitely what we need for Harlequins with Marcus Smith at the helm. Good times. Let's do that. Um. I thought I'd imagined this, but I haven't. Go for it. Jerry Flannery is Harlequin's line-out coach. Oh. Now. Joining the coaching group this summer. Ah. Now here it don't, might... don't get me wrong. Like, I'd take line-out advice from Jerry Flannery. Oh, yeah. But so, and are, are they going to have Flannery and Wilson doing lineouts, may, may, maybe and then Flan- Wilson also doing contact? Maybe Flannery's away in the summer. Maybe that's the maybe. Maybe he's off skate, or maybe he's getting a promotion to assistant skills coach, <laughs> or or chief chief skills coach, where he ov- oversees all the skills coaching. Who knows? Who knows? Uh, let's on on. We'll, we'll stay on the topic of Scotland for a second. Because we kind of should, because it's a Scottish rugby podcast. Uh, the fixtures for the World Cup warm up have been announced. Um, interestingly, lots of teams last couple of weeks have been announcing their summer fixtures, and it kind of left not very much for Scotland to pick up on. Um, but in fairness, we've got two matches against France, and we've got Italy and Georgia. So, um, for a World Cup in France, playing the hosts twice, home and away. Doesn't seem that bad. Yeah, I think it should be. And it's an interesting way of doing it. We've got, you know, we've got three home games. Um, I think, is it the third game, the France one, that's an away one? It's away, So yeah, we're going yeah, to obviously yeah. do uh, a home starter, another home game, fly to France, do an away game, fly back, is a good way of preparing ourselves for World Cup yep. travel schedules. Decent quality of opponents, I think, we should turn over Georgia and Italy fairly handily. France will be two good ones. So 
it's it's a couple of good opportunities to put some plans into practice and an opportunity to te- two opportunities to test ourselves against a genuine contender for the World Cup. So um good choices, well organized, I think, and, and it's rare that I'm that glowing about an SRU scheduling. <laughs> I so. do want won- I would I wonder if the the way the pool is set up has actually influenced our choice of fixtures as well. Well, I say our choice. I think Georgia um, being the the last one up, Georgia obviously renowned for their scrummaging ability. You've got Georgia and then, you know, 12 days later, you've got South Africa and then you've got Tonga and Romania as well. You know, Romania are not, not, you know, no disrespect for them. They're not a brilliant side, but they know how to scrummage. So I think Georgia might be there just as that kind of final final point of kind of just setting the forwards up. Um, I, we always play Italy in warm-ups, and I guess it's probably worth just isolating that and saying that's exactly what they are. They're warm-up matches, um, and we'll, we'll take we'll take that from there. But, yeah, having France twice will be good. Looking forward to it. Looking forward to yeah, it. Yeah, so I think that, that'll be uh, interesting. I, I see we have been uh, joined... By the boys themselves. Here they are. The the oh. the, the B squad have arrived. Better <laughs> late. The bomb the bomb squad. The bomb squad. Ah, yeah, the bomb squad have arrived. Uh, Cammy's on the beers, so the bomb squad definitely have arrived. <laughs> um, I heard the bias was going crazy, so I thought I'd better not, get on here. Not at all. The, no. That's fake news, Craig. Whoever told told you that was lying to you. I believe Doogie Low every time, so don't nah, worry he was it. at it. He was at it. <laughs> I, I was I was saying nothing, nothing. I'm just Mate. waiting. I bet. I bet you there was several mentions of Hugh Pilotu. I can get, just guarantee. Not yet. No. Well, no. No. Started on that yet? No. I was <laughs> saving that for when you arrived, Kig. <laughs> we were just talking about the warm-up fixtures, guys, uh, and having France twice decent. We think the scheduling's pretty good, um, and Georgia is definitely a preparation for South Africa's bomb squad. So, uh, <laughs> what, what's your thoughts, Cammy? Um, yeah, it's fine. I. I mean, it's fairly. I, Unsurprising, I guess, with the name that you know, Georgia, Italy, and a couple of a couple of games against France, it's fine. You know, I think there'll be good tests. I'll be interested to see how well it sells. That's the only thing. I think France will sell out. Um, Italy. Now, at the minute, I got an email from the SRU earlier today saying there were sixty thousand for Italy, and and they expect it to sell out in time for. And you know, they've they've still got a couple of months to go, but. In the autumn, and, and we know they will deny this. In the autumn, they were struggling to ship tickets for the autumn yeah. test. For the not for the, the obviously the New Zealand game sold out, but the other games they struggled to to get sell, sold out. BT Murrayfield. So I think <clears throat> Italy and Georgia are hard sells in the summer. I don't know. Is do you you don't have the August bank holiday in Scotland, do do you? Uh, I, I don't see you even... because it's because I live in England. For 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 new listeners to the podcast, <laughs> I live in England, so I have to. I don't. I don't keep up with the Scottish bank holidays. You don't get the late August one because you're all back at school by then. I yeah. don't even know what bank holidays I get anymore. Like because they kind of just works for you once. Pretty much. Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Had to work so, today. I was very upset about it. So that's. I mean, that's a bank holiday in, in England. Uh, the rest of the UK, I think that's a bank. Uh, that, that's a bank holiday. The Georgia game, but. You know, you've got the festival on, you've got lots of other things happening. It's the summer, people are away on holiday. I just think it'll be interesting to see. And I think it'll depend heavily on the Six Nations. Scotland have a good Six Nations, they'll sell it, they'll, they'll sell them out. But I think yeah. George, I wouldn't be surprised if George's uh, buy an adult ticket, get a kid's ticket for a pound. You've just reminded me that 2019, we did the last warm up game. And it was the last weekend of the fringe and getting the train from Edinburgh back to Fife was the single most unpleasant experience of my entire life. Going home on the last train after the rugby on the last night of the fringe was hell on earth. And if they're planning on doing that again, they need to have some sort of plan in place. Because I think we were we were on a three carriage train, I think, that was going all the way back to our broth. And it was the last train. There was no choice. People were like <laughs> lying in the luggage racks and stuff. It was horrendous. This is this is Scott Rail. I mean, the the absolutely top notch banter on the Twitter from Scott Rail. But yeah, absolutely <laughs> hoping <laughs> range and train travel. 
Craig, Craig, welcome. Good to have you along. What's what's your take on the the fixtures? I mean, they're kind of pointless, really, aren't they? Because we're not going to do anything at the World Cup anyway. No, it might be some people's chance to see the last the last uh, Jagger Townsend game plan <laughs> at home. You yeah, never I think know. I think I think Italy um, and the Six Nations might be that, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is that as well. Yeah, yeah. You never know. You never know. We will come um, on to this yeah, in due course, guys. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I, I, again, it's 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 warm up games. I'm I'm unconvinced with two France games. Um, I, I'm not convinced by that at all. I would have liked to have seen them playing someone else to get a bit of variation. But um, as you say, they don't. You know, it's whatever. Um, you know, uh, whatever comes along, they'll co- come along. Um, when was the last time they, did they not play Georgia? Like uh, did we? Because I'm sure I went to it. It was through in um, uh, Glasgow, but it was like they did not play. Was it Georgia that they played? Um... 20, 2019, 2019 warm-ups were two games against Georgia home and away, and two games against France mm-hmm. home and away. France home away. Mm-hmm. Um, because I was, I reported on the second France game, and that's when I realised how tall Jamie Ritchie was, <laughs> and how short John Barkley is. Interestingly, that <laughs> found that out on the same day. Dear, dear diary, Jamie Ritchie is so tall. I th- I John Barkley a... is not as tall as he claims to be. It's not. <laughs> I, think, I think the Georgia game you're thinking of, Craig, was the the game down at Kilmarnock or something. Uh, down at Kilmarnock, yeah. yeah, which I covered for the blog uh, with 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 others, and uh, yeah, and I was standing beside the bus with my like my press pass on and stuff like that and, and like the Georgian coach and all that clearly thought I was important and got like shoot my hand as he came off and stuff and I was like hey, I was just wanting to see you like Gorgodza. Uh, it, it was it clearly thought I was important. So good times. It was just your gait and the way you looked it was obviously importance just oozes yeah, from you. Yeah, that's how you that, carry yourself. Yeah. This is it. This is it. You don't get this in the podcast, especially not in the audio version. <laughs> <laughs> It's always fun to see who gets capped over the summer warmths as well, because fa- famously, uh, that's where Hugh Blake got his, his Scotland Yeah, caps. he did, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, Hugh Blake, the centre flanker himself. Yeah. Loved it, loved it. Um, sh- shall, shall we move on? We'll just we'll touch a wee bit on the rugby at the weekend there. Um, as, as I said in the prelude to this, we were, we were talking about uh, Edinburgh's supreme victory against the giants of world rugby that are Zebra, um, scraping through at the end, you know, really, really toughing it out, Craig. Good stuff from them. Oh, so are you, are you want me to comment on it? Are you? Are you just going to just, 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 you just, you just discuss it amongst I, yourselves? No, I, I think it would be really nice to hear how you found it. Um, uh, well, I think you got my comments uh, on the uh, on Messenger when, uh, when I was standing there. <laughs> I had to explain those comments to my son, by the way, because I read them out. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell everyone what the comments were and how that conversation went once we get to the second half of the podcast. Johnny, you should know not to let your son near any of your electronics. He you might see your history. <laughs> but um, it's, uh, but uh, I think it's it was the problem I have is it was it was a difficult game to uh, that they you know to watch, but we came away with five points. That's that's so the thing. you know, as far as I'm concerned, it's job done. Um and we we played a, a game with a, people out of position, played a game with, with, with different players on, on the field than we normally have. Um uh, just a big shout out to Paddy Harrison who's re signed uh today um, that uh, he's a he's a phenomenal talent at hook, and I think we're going to see a lot more. And thank goodness we've secured him for four years. Um, we said very nice things about him before you arrived, by the way. We just did. for the record, yeah, um, he he really um, you know. So it's one of those situations. I think I think we we were looking a little bit rudderless until Big Bill came on. So did Ben Velicott, Um and they seemed to sort things out. Unfortunately, James Lang came on for. A, for five minutes and then uh, ended up having to go off with a head, uh, you know, head knock. So, um, but it, it is what it is. We, as far as I'm concerned, it's just it's what we needed, and we move on. It's funny, Cammy, isn't it? Because we, we, like, all joking aside, we, we, you know, a, a bonus point win is a bonus point win, and the record books won't won't care a jot that it was squeaky bum time. No, I think there there is something interesting though. Going on at end, Brad. I'm kind of, I'm, I'm interested. This is, I don't want this to be a pile on Craig. I'm genuinely interested in your take on this. Is that Mike Blair coming out and saying he's struggling to get the best out of players? 
Mm. Then we've got um, Ben Ben Healy, the monster yeah, plant coming com, coming in at ten, and you know, an Ember, Ember on paper, and and as we are led to believe with the, you know, I don't want to get into the whole King Hon thing again, but you know, Ember aren't bad for ten, so something has changed to make Ember want to go out and recruit a ten at the same time. Mike Blair saying he's struggling to get the best out of players, and that. It could just be a bit of candid honesty from Mike Blair, which would be refreshing. That that's where Ember are at the moment. He's he's trying to figure out what what's going wrong. He's being open and honest with the players in the media, and I think that that's refreshing. But at the same time, it could be read the other way, which is just like, well, I don't know what I'm doing at the minute. I don't know what to do, and and things aren't aren't going as they should be. What do you think from a coaching point of view? They're struggling, Craig, or do you think it's one of those just kind of Difficult patches every team goes through and has to get through now and again. For me, uh, if if I if I look at from the outside in, yes, that that did cross my mind when he came out and said, you know, I, I'm I'm having to do better myself because I'm a I'm a bit stuck here. Um, it kind of, it gave me a little alarm bell. But on the other side of things, if you look back at what was said when he first came on board, um. That he said that he, he initially turned it down. He didn't want the job. He didn't feel he was ready for it. And and Scott and you know um, Jim Malander and 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 the Scott the SRU convinced him to take it. And I think we and again we always talk about the difficult second album. Um, and and he has had this bump in in while wow, look at how look how much he's turned Edinburgh around, but. Where I think we're, we're we're struggling at this moment in time, um, and where he needs to maybe have a deeper look into it is is just the physicality of the squad that we're starting to lose the physicality. Where Cockrell brought that very much to the fore, to the point it got boring because it was always going into the forwards. He's a, he's he's energized the backs. He's told the backs like you know we've got a, we've we've got movement. We know exactly what movements we want, but also play what's in front of you. But but we are losing that physical gain line um, in both attack and in defence. You know, Zebra just ran at us at times and we're breaking through. And so I think it's maybe and, and not to not to be the Wilson, um, uh, Danny Wilson where he, he sacked the the defence coach because he, he blamed it on him. But um, I think. There has to be a little bit of a look at the defence coach and say, you know, what is going on here, and maybe the boys need to look at themselves as well. You know, I think to be honest as well, being a head coach in Scotland <clears throat> for the pro clubs has its own kind of unique challenges in the way that the the clubs are set up in relation to the national setup and the union and how we deal with things, because. When Mike Blair's talking about how how he's struggling to get the best out of players, you're not always getting to do exactly what you want to do with your playing staff when you're when you're head coach of a, of the pro clubs in Scotland. If you think back to the week before the Tonga game in last year's autumn internationals, which was kind of right at the start of the Kinghorn experiment, it was maybe Blair Kinghorn's second or third start at ten for Edinburgh, and the same weekend Ross Thompson was starting at fifteen for Glasgow for the first time. And I don't think any of the coaching staffs at that point were particularly sold on either of those ideas. But because it comes down from the national setup that that's what their plan is and that's where that's what they need these players to do, then all of a sudden you start having to ask your players to do stuff that maybe isn't a your game plan that maybe you don't think suits the way they play for you. And that's something that I don't think a lot of other club coaches have got to deal with. So I think that must be really difficult. I always think that when when you see players getting kind of shoehorned into doing parts of their Scotland role in their clubs and it leads to them being out of position or doing a different job to usual. It's not something that a lot of other coaches have got to deal with and it must be really difficult. It's interesting as well when they talk about, so the, the press conferences that were talking about certain players being managed. So obviously the people that are Scotland internationals, they, they are managed in their game time. The club don't have to manage all Scottish players. It's just the players within the national setup. So as a club becomes more successful or, you know, starts to get a bit of form and player, players get called up, it becomes more challenging for the coach. So that, you know, Edinburgh did have a good year last year. 
and we're providing more players to the Scotland setup than they have done historically. So with that comes, as you rightly say, Johnny, those those extra challenges of managing game time and making sure people are getting the rest periods that they need. I think the other I think the other thing that, that you don't get as a coach until and, and you, you quite I think I agree with you, you're exposed as a coach in Scotland because there's our setups are really fairly unique that you go from being a you know Mike Mike Blair was one an assistant coach in charge of skills and attack right so that's his remit to a certain extent he's getting told what to do by his boss by Gregor Townsend in in Scotland as it was he's told what to do it's directed at him he might he'll chip in with his own ideas but but he'll have a little bit of autonomy but and he's in control of his own little bit but he doesn't have to fit all the pieces together he's not in charge of putting it all together I think he's then again as you said Craig reluctantly appointed as Ember coach I, to me, he's got all the tools and all the skills to be a, a, a very, very, very good head coach. I think he communicates very well. I think he, he's obviously a, you know, he, well, it's hard to say for a former professional rugby, but you know, he understands the game mm. and the modern game, even though he's not played for a while. But it's a certain skill, I think, to one, to delegate to others and give them the responsibility and manage a team of coaches as well as a team of players and to give them that responsibility. But at the same time as delegating the responsibility also to give direction to say, no, I don't want you to do that. I want you to do this instead, whilst also giving them the kind of autonomy to come up with their own ideas. So it's a it's it's a real skill to do that. And I think, you know, the first year they're all getting to know each other. It's a bit of a honeymoon period and everything just clicks. But probably the second season, that's that's there'll be the communication is really the key. And how how much control does Mike Blair want to have over the rest of the team needs to have I suppose over his coaches how much autonomy does he give them how confident is he in telling them that no they're doing it wrong and he wants them to change the way they're doing it and have those conversations so that's it's a skill in of itself and I don't there's not like a I don't think there's like a step up into that you know there's not like a kind of a way you can be eased into that job you just you're just doing it um and I think it's probably more exposed than Gregor Townsend was when he took over Glasgow because rugby just didn't have the profile that it has now in Scotland, the, the the pro teams aren't under the same level of scrutiny as they are now. So when Gregor Townsend did it, it, you know, he probably flew under the radar for a couple of seasons before, you know, but what, to get, get used to how things are. And I'm not really sure he learned on the job anyway, as we'll come on to. But now for Mike Blair, you know, he he's put in a situation where he's not only having to manage a, a team of players, he's having to manage a team of coaches. He's having to work with them. He's having to get the best out of a lot of people and that's a real skill to go in at the top of an organisation and do that and, we, and and kind of almost not get involved in the day-to-day stuff. He can to an extent, but he hasn't got time. He hasn't got time to be on the training pitch every day doing everything. So he, it's, you know, that's a, I don't know how you do it, but I think I wonder whether part of it is he needs to step away from getting the best out of the players. That's his coach's job is to get the best out of the players. He needs to get out the best out of his coaches to get the best out of the players. And that's a skill I don't think we've developed in Scotland very well in our coaches. Yeah, and I, I think also, you know, for for me, as a fan and as, as someone who has seen the dark days of Edinburgh, now, John, you had a fairly a fairly big take on it in our chat about saying it's that they're almost as bad as as um as Edinburgh a few years ago. Um I I I, I wouldn't go that far. Um, it, they have echoes of it, um, and it's almost like, especially when it comes to defence, you know, I, I, they have echoes of it. But all of the all of the mixture is there. All of the ingredients are there, and I still stand by it. There, the, there's a top, there's a top four team in there. It's that's it's, it's and there's a top four coach in there. It's it's how do we get that? On the field and get and string those those um, those games together. I think I I don't want to kick it down the road constantly, but I think next season is going to be the make or break um, because he's going to have Ben Healy there. He's going to have two. He's going to have whether people laugh or joke or whatever they want to say, but he's going to have high level tens at his disposal, um, and and he's going to have Savala in the background. So, the problem is though then. 
that comes back to what I was just saying a minute ago, because what is whoever is in the head coaching job of Scotland next season going to want him to do with those tens? Is he going to get to do what he wants to do, play the game plan he wants to play, or is he going to come up with a game plan for Blair Kinghorn and then the national coaching staff come across and say, oh, actually, no, we're moving towards Ben Healy for this next block of games, so chuck that game plan. Here's what we want Ben Healy to do. I, I, I Honestly, we, that is all up in the air now, Johnny, because, because you know, you've got to look at Ben Healy. Everyone reported in, in, the, in, the, in all the reports about Ben Healy, Townsend has been at Ben Healy to come over and play for Scotland for so long, this, that, and the other, and all of a sudden Townsend's looking for another job. So, if I was Ben Healy and I've just signed this contract, I'm thinking, well, what the hell am I going to do? And and so, unless, if you look at it in a roundabout way, has Ben Healy been told that Mike Blair's in line for moving up to Scotland? And you've got to, because Ben Healy coming to, coming to Edinburgh, although I can see we needed a 10 of his, of we needed a 10 of his, of his experience and his boot. Um, Glasgow, could have quite easily have taken him a year ago. So why, why? Because there was talk of him coming in, coming into Glasgow a year ago. Yeah, so, but he so, chose to stay at Munster because he was given assurances regarding the succession planning for Ireland at ten, aye, but what, which what haven't trying, transpired. Yeah, they haven't transpired. But, but why are we not then talking about him at, at Glasgow now than coming to Edinburgh? So what is that? What are the reasons for that? And and if Tunis on his way out, and everyone and, and Tunis decided he's on his way out. Why is he then telling this guy, look, you come and play for Scotland now, come and play for Scotland now, and, and I'm going to put you into my team when he's he's just about out the door for you know six months down the line. So it's a really interesting movement that, that I'm 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 looking forward to see what, what's going to happen. I don't think Mike Blair's ready for Scotland. Um uh, but what what is all clicking around? Because there's obviously things clicking around if, if Townsend's looking for another job. I think the answer to your point, Craig, regarding why, why was Healy not mentioned for Glasgow, to, Tom Jordan's a simple answer to that. Tom Jordan has has really stepped up this season and is now, when Ross Thompson comes back, everyone's really interested to see how Thompson will go under Franco Smith's game plan, which is night and day from Danny Wilson. So, you know, Ross Thompson's got a lot, uh, will still have an opportunity to to try and put his stamp on that shirt and, and get that shirt. But Tom Jordan's got that shirt nailed down at the moment. And Ben Healy coming in would struggle to get it off him the way Jordan's playing at the moment. I, I see Healy quite as quite. I watched the, the Munster game on the weekend, even though the weather was horrendous. He does rem, not, he doesn't remind me of Tom Jordan as slightly slightly maybe pushing the boat, but he, he's got that physicality. He's a bigger lad. Now, okay, if you're not Blair Kinghorn's a big lad, but um I, I, I think there's a there's a there's there's more to Healy um than Blair Kinghorn when it comes to a ten, a standard natural ten. Um whereas Blair Kinghorn is this this all round athlete. But again, you know, everyone's talking about the, the, the Kinghorn um uh, experiment being over. Well, you know, in my mind, he's, he's a fantastic ten for, for Edinburgh, and we're happy with him at ten. But I'll tell you what, he's going to be a great, a great player, utility player for Scotland, um, yeah, sitting on the like, bench and covering, covering it, covering ten, wing and 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 fifteen. I've I've said this before. I honestly think that like the actual perfect end result of the Kinghorn experiment, or whatever you want to call it, was to turn him into Franz Steen and. It seems to have been more successful than not if that's what we're going to do in the end. Because now we could go 6 2 whenever we want and put, put Blair King on the bench. He's probably going to end up back in the back three for this year's Six Nations. Yep. Shall we? Shall we? Uh, any more in Edinburgh? Anyone get anything else to offer? It's it's not all doom and gloom. You've got, uh, you've got a game away away in France at the weekend, which, you know, that's another confidence builder for you. So you'll be two two for two at the end of the weekend, and that'll be you. So you'll be it's on same a roll. Time, so I'm, and I'm, and, and I'm, unfortunately, I'm not getting the chance to, to shout at Owen Farrell, so I'm really disappointed in that one. But uh, well, um, We will, we'll we will come on to that also in due course, I think. <laughs> I, fear, I fear that might get a mention later in the podcast. Um <laughs> Shifting across the road, uh, Glasgow obviously had the pleasure of uh, welcoming that uh, minnow team from South Africa, the Stormers. Uh, and, uh, like, all joking aside, 
what an occasion it was at Scottsdale. It was absolutely brilliant. Great game of rugby. Um, the, the only downside of it all, and this will come as no surprise to anyone who's ever listened to me, was Andrew Brace, who was honking. But everything else was amazing. It was a great game of rugby. Jo- uh, Johnny, I take it, I take it, you watched the game. Oh, I did. Yeah, we we went back and forwards on going, and eventually ended up not decided not to. Equal parts gutted and quite relieved because the atmosphere looked amazing and all the family day stuff and that looked brilliant. The weather looked absolutely miserable. It was terrible. Um, yeah. I don't think if I'd taken the kids, I would have been thanked for that. So I'm kind of glad we just watched it at home, but I'm glad we did watch it. Although uh, my six-year-old uh, did, tur- did turn around at one point in the game and go, Dad, what's a brace you throbber? <laughs> and I was like, t- it's actually three words, mate, but I'll explain it to you in a while. In 10 years' time. Because, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, he was his usual interesting self. Cammy, does it, does it speak to, like, obviously we've talked about the pro teams and and the national team in some ways uh, inability to win away from home. Uh, we continue to have this knack of welcoming the best teams in the world in, in the case of the Stormers and not saying they put out a full full strength team. They absolutely didn't. But you know, it, they, there was a couple of Springboks in there. You're welcoming a very very good side to Scotland, and you know, walking away like Craig said before, a five point win. Yeah, and uh, you know, I think it's it's we're at the point with both pro teams, and and even to a certain extent Scotland, where it's like, oh yeah, we're in at home, fine. Do you know what I mean? A, a narrow loss at home to, against a good side, fine. And that's, I think it's what we've come to expect now, and, and quite rightly so. That you know the big European teams will come to Glasgow, they'll come to Edinburgh, and they'll be given a, a they'll be pushed all the way. And that's a great thing, but until until you know Glasgow away, go away at the Stormers, or you know I can finally can beat Saracens away from home, then it's all for now. Do you know what I mean? We it's it's great to have a, that kind of home, that kind of sense of having your kind of your home to defend and to be put on a show and have all the fans coming. But I think until you can until you can do it away from home on a regular basis. It, it's, you know, it, it, I don't think it shows any progress. So have your day. Enjoy the win against the Stormers. <laughs> it was a great game. There were some nice tries. It was nice to see Hugh Jones back playing well. But I, I just, I don't. It's lovely. You, you go, oh well, that's good. That's we, we, you know, we, we beat a big team at home. But I'm, I'm at the point now where it's, it's a bit boring. Yeah, fine. It's just, it's, it's something we've come to expect that both. Pro size will do well against anyone that turns up to play them at home. Until it starts happening away from home regularly, I'm. It I I I meet it with a disinterested shrug, as I do with um, a lot of things I feel about pro rugby in Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> being being as I am, complete, completely ambivalent about either side. You, you you do like to get your neutrality in there quite often, so that that that's good. Um, I'm neutral yeah, to the point of being disinterested in both. Just, aye, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, you did mention Hugh Jones, so I'll come to you, Craig. Uh, Hugh Jones uh, played played at the weekend. Definitely put his hand up for Scotland selection, man of the match. Um, I, 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 have you have you seen seen the match, Craig? Seen the highlights? Uh, enjoyed the wonders uh, of of Hugh Jones and that try he scored. Uh, <laughs> I thought you to talk about my future husband, Hugh Jones, and I don't. I, I'm, I'm just wanting Craig to enjoy it because I thought you might want to talk about Tio Pilotu, Johnny. Or or Hugh Pilotu, as everyone's been now uh, thinking that that's what's, that's what's going to happen when it comes to the Six Nations. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm interested to see how he goes. Uh, I, I thought he started working well when I watched him play, uh, play for Harlequins, um, and he suits that sort of um open attack play quite well um and actually there's there's one name that's put his hand up for international glory quite quite quickly um within glasgow and that is uh um uh, and that is uh pete horn um <laughs> because because 
we've we've got a, a gap for an attack coach at this moment in time in Scot- uh, for Scotland. And I'll tell you what, um, as I watched the I watched the game, watched the interviews at the beginning, and everyone was talking about how Franco Smith has come in, but he's also he's directing things and he leaves Pete Horn to get on and, do, and deal with his attack. And I think that's the sharpest I've seen Glasgow for some time in attack. Pete so, Horn is not the Glasgow attack coach, though. As I thought he was attack coach. He is not. He is the breakdown coach. Mm, right, okay. They've given, some, they've given Pete Horn breakdown. Yep. I was. A, I, I, I've been told he's the attack coach, or he's part of. He's, he's part. Well, obviously the breakdown plays a. So, what, 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 what does Pete Horn know about the breakdown? Ah, uh, well, he has been. He he, he, George he, is he, rapid, and so everyone else has to be rapid. He, he threw it. He threw it. I threw that comment away in an interview at some point about doing breakdown. But um, I, I'm sure he was. I, I'm sure he was. The attack coach is Nigel Carolyn. Right. Sure okay. Is. Well, I, I have to sit back and shut up then because. So, uh, but um, Glasgow, we were talking about it before you guys arrived. Pete Horn has the the breakdown at Glasgow just now is rapid. It's the fastest breakdown in the league. It's the only team under three seconds for average ball speed for getting the ball away at rucks. They are playing really quickly, and the game plan they've got revolves around Pete Horn. And so you're you're right in saying that the attack flourishes because of what Pete Horn's doing. It's just mm. he's not the attack coach. That's interesting because I I had uh, I, uh, yeah it was mentioned anyway. I I, I thought I picked it up, but I obviously picked it up wrong. Um, but uh, shows you how interested I am in Glasgow. But um, uh, <laughs> so, but no, I, I, I think it's it's one of those situations. I think we have to be careful, and just as Cami says, um, have your day, enjoy your win, get some more season tickets sold, um, and and see how we go. Because Hugh mm. Jones has no, no, I'm not, I'm not meaning it bitchy. What I'm trying to say is, you know. Hugh Jones can blow hot and cold, so you have to be careful with him. You have to be careful and put, you know, being getting so loved up like Johnny does. That um, oh, he's, he's gorgeous and he was magnificent though. And I agree with you, Craig. Though I think he plays well. Suits, I'm not. I'm it suits a certain part. type of gameplay, and actually, it's oh, interesting that he would he would almost fall off the radar when when you know Townsend changes his game plan and is looking for a defensive thirteen and what have you. Franco Smith's got Glasgow playing like. Glasgow used to play and it's it's frantic and it's fast and Jones flourishes in that and so does a lot of the other players but it's not necessarily how Scotland play so we may we may see a disconnect there I just I like the fact that Craig went fully into that come down with me meme mode of like what a sad little life Jane you've won <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy your win, but you've home. not carried yourself with the decorum of. <laughs> <laughs> Come back after you've scored a 79th minute try to beat Zebri at home. And then <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Don't start your don't start your pish with me when you're coming up against a, 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 a big a big European team. Then you'll see. <laughs> well, well um, I'll tell you. Actually, speaking well, of uh, of Scotland is uh, when it was announced that Christmas, in amongst my rage at the idea of making a winger captain, what I did say was Kyle Stane's an experienced player. I don't think he'll be spending that much time in the Scotland camp. He'll be around to be a really good captain for Glasgow. I think he's going to be spending quite a lot of time in the Scotland camp coming up um, because obviously with Darcy being injured, with question marks around Duhan, uh, Kyle Stane was phenomenal again he was really on Sunday. He's, he's put together much like Patrick Harrison, a month of really, really good performances in a position where we need to bring in someone who's played well for this year's Six Nations, and I think we'll see quite a lot of Kyle Stane. Cammy looked like he was wanting to to jump in there. No, no you're not. <laughs> you're all about no, the Kyle Stane. You, you, you have the to Stain. Kyle Stane hype train. Oh, I mean, well... <sighs> I remember when everyone lost it when he scored a hat trick of tries against who was that Georgia? Four against Tonga. Four tries. Tonga. And everyone's like, oh, this is amazing. He scored four tries in international rugby. It's it was Tonga, right? Yo. <laughs> cool your jets. I think it's gonna be I'm not saying I could do it, but <laughs> <I'm just saying. laughs> because I think you know, for me it's it's how what do we value in our in our thirteen? Um, because you know, there's a, there's a Doogie's commented as well uh, in in the comments. You know, he's never going to displace Harris. Well, 
Yeah, but I'm not convinced Harris is the best attacking 13 that Much we can not. put on the field. So, you know, how are, how is Townsend going to take this Six Nations? Is he has he decided that he's going to stick with the defence if you know we're going to we're going to let others play with the ball and then we're going to work on 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 um, on their mistakes or, or are we going to keep the ball and actually try to play with it this year? Uh, I, I disagree. I'm I'm, I'm going to disagree with you, Craig. I think Chris Harris is a good attacking thirteen. I just don't think that's the, what he's asked to do when he plays for Scotland. I think his two. I think his primary role there is to organise the defensive line mm-hmm. and to disrupt the opposition attack. But I've seen Chris Harris do run some very nice attacking lines before. I think he can do it. I'm not saying he can do the Hollywood kind of offloads and stuff and the kind of stuff Sione Tiopolotto can do. But he's Sione Tiopolotto is the is is what Gregor Townsend wishes he'd had when he first became Scotland coach. I don't necessarily think it's what. Scotland need right now at this stage I, th- I still think there's an argument for pragmatism within a Scottish defence and attack I don't think we're at a point where we're so solid that we can afford to be a little bit more fancy I think, so I, think I, still, seen... I think I think Chris Harris offers enough and I think he offers stuff in attack I just don't think he's been used in that way I think because we've seen two or two at 12 though and actually, he's grown into that 12 role a bit more as well. I've, I've got no doubt I, w- I would put good money on it just now. You'll see two or two and Harris 12 13 starting against England. All, all, be very all, sure. all things yeah. considered, two or two is the form Scottish player, like period, right now. He is absolutely tearing it up and has been all season. And he offers, you know, I don't want to crow Jim Hamilton's nonsense, but he is different to anything we have. But he's also solid in all the basics that we would want to see at twelve, and the right. fact that he's able to kick and distribute, he, he's he's the twelve we've been needing. When was the last time you saw any Scottish player forward or back break the line with three South Africans hanging off him backwards? <laughs> yeah, well, running <laughs> backwards. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I've seen Darcy Graham do that. <laughs> but Darcy isn't available, or else he could play True. twelve. <laughs> True. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see. You know, I, th- I think there's a few people... It'll be interesting to see who we start to get back from injury as well, because obviously, Craig, I saw Hamish Watson's back training. Yeah. Great, great news, obviously, and it'll be interesting to see if he gets some game time before the Six Nations. Uh, Tom Gordon's back for Glasgow as well, so seven options starting to starting to recover, and Rory Darge, uh, there is rumours he'll be back for the, for the sort of midpoint of the Six Nations as well, so... The, the stocks in the forwards will probably start to build up again. The problem for me, you know, we'll obviously do a proper Six Nations preview when the time comes, but prop's going to be the issue, isn't it, really? It always is in Scotland, but tight head's going to be an absolute nail-biter. Nah, we've, next got, week. we've got Javan Sebastian in the wings, that we think. You are clearly just <laughs> up for winding me up tonight. Nick Nick otorak has been on Twitter this week saying he likes haggis. Yeah, so, you know, I saw that. That was that was very cryptic. I mean, yeah. not as cryptic as he thinks it was. I don't think. <laughs> I don't think so. Seeing as he's had about five minutes for Edinburgh in the last like you know five or six games, you know. Yeah, but I was going to say that would be proper tom- tomboa stuff, wouldn't it? Or tunboa. Uh, that would be. But if Murphy know... Walker's injured and stuff like that, you know, he's he's, he's going to be. Is, is, is he? You know, is he? He's a loose head, though, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's going to be a bit it. <laughs> well, you know. we're, we're absolutely swimming in loose heads, mate. No, I mean we're hardly swimming, but we've got <laughs> we've got a few. We've got we're we're not we're not at thirty seven year old WP now, and <laughs> nobody else. That <laughs> we're not at that stage, so. Um, Learn to do what I'm reliably informed is a totally different job from loose head, and then we'll talk. I mean, it looks like the same job to me, but whatever. I mean, Ollie Kebo made it look like the same job, but you know, whatevs. That's because he's. Whoa! <laughs> oh. Bef- one bef- 56 19. And two, <laughs> an absolutely cardinal sin <laughs> to come on here and come after my not so slim shady. The not so slim shady. How dare you? Honestly, Manson, you are naughty step. <laughs> naughty step. 
At this rate, you'll be playing tight head for Scotland. This is this is the second <laughs> time. This, this is the second week, week in a row. I've sworn on the on the non. Yeah, the non, yeah, uh, I know. Uh, you know, honestly, we're, we're going to have I'm dragging the pod out the gutter. We're going to start some disciplinary. Speaking of dragging things out, just because you beat the Stormers, don't think you can drag the Glasgow analysis out over a half an hour, John Anderson. Yeah, <laughs> I think you. We didn't even fine. start the Glasgow analysis to like forty-five minutes. 40, 40, 45 minutes. Yeah, I've, I've timed this very well. I gave fifteen to Edinburgh, fifteen to Glasgow, and thirty to nonsense. Don't get me wrong, <laughs> Glasgow. Glasgow played very, very well, but let's not get ahead of ourselves just yet. I don't. So all all things considered, I don't think anyone is actually getting ahead. Of, I think. Oh no, deli- yeah, there is. I think people are delighted with the win, but. I don't yeah. think necessarily, like, again, a lot of people are just seeing this for what it is. It's progression. It's a team building. There's some really, really, like, people are excited because it's proper Glasgow rugby again. It's people yeah. seeing yeah. Glasgow throwing the ball about and enjoying that. that that's that's what people want to see. Is it was fun. It was yeah. really good fun. Believe and me, we, it was, we enjoyed it, it. It was like us last year. So I'm not. I don't want to. T- I, I honestly don't want to take away from it. We, you know, it, you got a new coach. He's coming and he's made a huge difference, especially for some of the, the results that you've had. And and now we're coming into it. You're getting some new results, Claire. So I'm I'm absolutely not trying to take away from it because it is. It's good news. It's good news for Scottish rugby. It's good to see people playing with a bit of confidence and we can only hope that can sit, continues into the Six Nations. I do think Edinburgh are a better team than they've shown in their form as well. So I think all, 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 is, all is rosy in Scottish rugby. Hey, who would have thought it? I've cracked it. Um, oh. mm. <laughs> is, it, is it, John? Well, I think if you want to find out if it's all rosy, you should come and join us for our Patreon uh, section. Uh, we will we will move over to there just now, but um, for now, we will we'll leave leave our free view customers. Goodbye. Uh, it's good night for me and good night, Johnny, Cami, and Craig. Bye. Good night. Bye, free people. <laughs> free people. <laughs>